Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. There are many important events that we read about in the Scripture. Obviously, the most significant, and we'll deal with this down the future, the resurrection of Messiah. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if there be no resurrection, then our faith is in vain. But praise God, Messiah did indeed raise from the dead. Likewise, another important thing concerning Messiah is His death, that death on the cross. But all of that came about, why? Well, another important event, and that is the birth of Messiah. And that is indeed what we're going to focus in on in today's study. So won't you be wise, not just listen, but take out your Bible and read along and follow. Look, just not hear, but look at God's anointed Word. You'll be surprised that when you put your eyes on the Word of God, it has an additional benefit, not just hearing, but also seeing the Scripture. So look with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. Here again, we're studying and the focus is the birth of Messiah. The Scripture says, And the birth of Messiah, that is, Messiah Yeshua, having been born in Bethlehem of Judea, so significant, of Judea, that location in that allotment of land given to the tribe of Judah. And it also says in Bethlehem. Now we talked in our study of the book of Ruth why Messiah was born in Bethlehem. King David was born in Bethlehem. And that close connection between David and the son of David, Messiah, Yeshua. He too, and this is prophetic, we'll come to this shortly. Look again. But Yeshua, having been born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi. Now, many people will talk about this word, Magi. It simply means wise men. The word is also, when we translate it into Hebrew, we see that it has to do with these sorcerers, these astronomers that uh, uh, would gaze into the sky and look at the sky for information. That's true. But realize, in the Greek language, the wise men also can apply to Jewish scholars. Why? Well, one of the things that's very important as Judaism is the calendar. In order to, to worship God according to these festivals, the festivals of the Lord that He gave to Israel, and Israel was supposed to teach them to the world, in order to keep them at the right time, we have to know the calendar. And I'm going to say something that perhaps you may have never heard. Other people have said, this is not original to me. But that is, these wise men, we usually think of them as uh, uh, non-Jewish. Now, it doesn't make any difference to me whether they were Jewish or not, but when we look at the Scripture, the Scripture is going to reveal to us by what the New Testament says that these individuals were indeed Jewish. They were the Tamidei Chachamim, which means the wise scholars. And why do I make such a position? Well, notice what the Scripture says very clearly. Behold, these wise men from the East. When we talk about the East, what should come into our mind is Babylon. From a Jewish standpoint, the East, what comes into our thoughts? Babylon, that Babylonian captivity that we talked about when we studied the genealogy. And we know that there were a great number of the Jewish people that did not come out of Babylon. They stayed there. 
And the view was, and this is a Midrash Rabbah, I won't go into what that is, but it's a tradition in Judaism, that they didn't go back with Ezra or Nehemiah or Zerubbabel. They stayed in Babylon waiting for Messiah. We all know that great scripture in Matthew 24, verse 31, where it talks about Messiah will send forth his angels and they will gather up the elect from the four quarters of, of the heavens, meaning wherever one might be. So they waited there to the birth of Messiah. And they followed a form of Judaism, a, a basis that was written in what's called the Babylonian Talmud, and these individuals were in the east. Notice what it says, Behold, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem. They came. Why did they come? Well, notice what they said, verse 2, saying, Where is the one born king of the Jews? Now, I would put a circle around that phrase, king of the Jews. How did they know about that? If they were some pagan astronomers, how would they know about this king of the Jews. Secondly, from a, a biblical standpoint, the term king of the Jews is a reference and it's a synonym for Messiah. So why would these pagans, if that's who they were, according to most Christian traditions, if they were pagans, how would they know about Christ, about Mashiach, about Messiah being the king of the Jews? And why would they speak about a birth Where's the one born king of the Jews? And it gets more specific. If you keep reading, it says, I'm quoting what they write, middle of verse 2, for we have seen his star in the east. What star are they referring to? And not only did they see that star, and they concluded from it that Messiah has been born, they came to Jerusalem and it says, for we want to worship him. So now they're talking about worshiping Messiah. Why all this? Well, the answer is very clear if you understand prophecy. They said, we have seen his star. What star? Well, if we, now we're going to go to the Hebrew Bible and join me in doing this. Look, if you would, to the book of Numbers, chapter 24. The book of Numbers and chapter 24 in Parashat Balak. We see something here we see a prophecy given to a Gentile man by the name of Bil'am, not a godly man, nevertheless, God gave revelation to. In fact, God gives revelation to many people, many of which don't respond to it or don't deal with it correctly. Notice what he says here. Look at the book of Numbers. Hope I said that right. The book of Numbers and chapter 24. In the Torah portion called Parshat Balak, Numbers chapter 24, and look at what it says in verse 14 at the end. It's speaking about what's going to happen to the Jewish people when? Be'acherit ha'yamim. That is, at the last days. So this has to do with the last days, and sometimes the last days simply mean anything having to do with the Mashiach, with Messiah. He says that he lifts up a oracle and he speaks, this one Balaam says, who is the son of Beor, who declares this, a man that is, is aware of things. It says his eyes are open, verse 16. Declares the one, still this one speaking, verse 16, declares the one who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, and a vision of Shaddai. Now this is the term Shaddai, which means God Almighty, the God who is sufficient, the God who is enough for all situation. He sees a vision of Shaddai, but it's really a vision of Messiah. He falls down, but his eyes are open. And notice this key verse, verse 17. Here again, the book of Numbers, chapter 24 and verse 17. What does it say here? This one is seeing a vision of Messiah, but it's a vision of the Most High God. He says, I, I see him, but not now. I behold him, 
but he's not close. Meaning, remember, this is early on. This is when the children of Israel were still in the Midbar, in the wilderness, the desert, traveling during those 40 years. And this one, Bil'am, saw the vision of Messiah. And what vision did he see? He says, it's, it's not for now, it's not cr close to being fulfilled, but nevertheless, I see a star traveling from Yaakov and will rise up a scepter from Israel. The scepter, Shevet in Hebrew, speaks about that ruling rod that Messiah will have. This is a messianic prophecy and it has to do with the birth of Messiah. And what's the, the picture of that, the image of that? A star. So when we go back and look at Matthew chapter 2, and let's do that where we left off. When we look at Matthew chapter uh, 2, and it says here, look at the middle of verse 2, for we have seen his star in the east and we have come to worship him. It all makes sense. They knew that prophecy from Numbers 24. They knew that prophecy and they knew who he was that would be born Messiah. It's El Shaddai. It's the Most High God entering into human flesh. And that's why it says we have come and worship Him. It makes no sense whatsoever to think that these are pagans. No, these are wise men in Judaism. They are sages and they knew the scripture. And they were looking in the sky because they had to keep the calendar. That's how they did that, by looking at stars and such for, for, for fixing the times and the seasons. That's what the book of Genesis chapter 1 says the stars and the moon and the sun are for, for times and seasons. So when they were doing that, they saw his star. Verse 3, and King Herod, hearing this, it says he was troubled. Why well, understand that? This is his replacement. He thought of himself as the king of the Jews, but he's not. It's Messiah. So he was troubled, but this is what I don't understand. It says, and all of Jerusalem with him. They were troubled. Jerusalem, why? This is good news about redemption, but it says something. What it tells the reader is simply this, that at that time the people were not kingdom-minded. They did not have a messianic expectation. They were not looking, they were not wanting the Messiah. And that is so sad. Now, there's something else that we're going to see, and that is that this star is unique. I was speaking to someone uh, just this week, and he was telling me about this video on YouTube. I mean, there's a video for everything on YouTube, is there not? about the star and that scientifically we can prove when that star was and, and what it was and so forth. Well, let me just tell you, I don't believe any of that. Why? Because we're not dealing with a star. We're not dealing with a natural occurrence, something that scientifically today we can look back. This is something supernatural. It is something that invaded nature. And when we look at it, which we're going to do, we see that it says nothing about a, a comet or something along those lines. It speaks about something unique. Let's pay attention. Look now to verse 4. First of all, we have to get the prophetic context for it. And gathering together all of the high priests and the scribes. Who was doing that? Herod. He was troubled about what he heard about Messiah being born. So he wanted to get information because he wanted to work against this. He was set on stopping the purpose of God. He did not want the redemption of God. Why? Because it interfered with his plans. And that's why many people don't submit to the gospel. They do not walk in faithfulness because they don't want God's purposes. They're not interested in His plans for their life. They want to do what they want to do and they'll war with God in order to continue their selfish plans. Very foolish and heading for disaster, anyone who has that view. So look again, verse 4, And gathering all the high priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired from them where the Messiah 
is to be born. And notice they didn't have to think about it. They knew. Verse 5. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, of Judea, for thus it has been written through the prophet, and we know what prophet? The prophet Micah. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2 in English, verse 1 in English, where Messiah is supposed to be born. Look now to verse 6. And you, Bethlehem, that is Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come forth a Moshel. Now, I give the Hebrew term. In the Greek, it simply says a leader. But when we look at the Hebrew, it's the word Moshel. That's so significant. Why? Well, this is a quotation from the prophet of Micah or Micah in Hebrew. And he uses the term Moshel, and that's very significant. Here again, when we study the book of, of Genesis, we talked about this. The term Moshel has to do with Yosef. This is Joseph who was sold into slavery in Egypt. And remember, God used him to deliver not just the Jewish people, but the world during those seven years of harsh famine. And here's the message. We learn a lot about Mashiach, about the Christ, through Joseph's life. And to help us understand that, that same term, he was called the Moshel, the ruler. And so is Messiah to tie these two things together. Messiah and Joseph, remember we talked about last week, that he is the son of Joseph, Messiah. Not uh, biologically this Joseph, but the Joseph who is married to Miriam. But nevertheless, that term, Ben Yosef, Mashiach Ben Yosef, has much to do. So look again, verse, verse 6. And you, Bethlehem, of the land of Judah, by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come the ruler, specifically tied to Messiah, who will shepherd my people Israel. So this prophecy once more, and remember how frequently Matthew's gospel does just that, relying upon the prophets in order to reveal and to teach, not just what the New Testament says, but we have to bring that Old Testament context of prophecy into it to have a fuller meaning. That's what the scripture is teaching us. Look now to to verse 7. Then Herod secretly called the wise men and by, by a very diligent manner. Now this word is not that frequent in the New Testament but it's going to appear several times in the next few verses. And it has to do with investigating something with great precision, with great care, thoroughly. And that's what he tells these wise men. He tells them that they are to go and to search thoroughly concerning the time that the star was manifested. Why? He wants to know the age of this child. When he was born, why? Well, we know why. He's going to want to put that child to death. But notice what the scripture says. Look now to verse 8. And he sent them into Bethlehem, he said, Go and seek diligently concerning the child. Look for him. And when you find this one, proclaim it to me, so that I also can come and worship him. Now that's a lie. He says that, but he has no intention of doing that. He wants to know where this child is, so he can put him to death so he can rebel against the purposes of God. Verse 9, And these, meaning these wise men, having heard the king, they went and behold the star. Now notice, they saw the star from the east. They were in presumably Babylon. They saw that unique star and they recognized something. And the star has to do with moving. It went, the star darach, that's what it says in, in Hebrew, 
in the book of Numbers chapter 24 and verse, verse 17. So the star moved and caused them to realize this is not normal. This is supernatural. This must be the fulfillment of Numbers chapter 24 verse 17. So they instantly left Babylon and traveled to Jerusalem. And this would take minimally six months, if not more. Well, they came and time is, is going. Things are happening. And that's why King Herod wanted to know the exact time. And he called them to search. Notice what it says? It says that they went and behold, the star which they had seen in the east, the same star, it says, went before them until it came and stood above where the child was. Now, that's not normal. A star doesn't do that. A comet doesn't do that. This is something that they knew was supernatural. It cannot be explained. And simply, I do not understand why. People want to look to science to find the supernatural rather than realize that, that oftentimes science can't confirm what the Word of God says. That doesn't bother me at all. I wouldn't expect it to. This is a unique happening. It is not a comet. It's not something that I realize there's books and all these teachings about the star of Bethlehem. Don't waste your time. Read what the scripture says about it. That's all you need to know. It is a supernatural phenomena. It is not something that's ever happened before, only at this time, and never will. It's for one purpose. And notice it says that that star went before them. I'm in the middle of verse 9 until it came and stood above where the child was, verse 10. And seeing the star, they rejoice in exceedingly great joy. So we have the word great for a great show, joy, but also the word for exceedingly, verse 11. And coming into the house, now I realize that according to, to Luke's Gospel, a stable is mentioned, but time has passed. He was born there, but now he's in a house. And it says, they saw the child with Miriam, that is Mary, his mother, and falling down, they worshiped him, and they opened up their treasures, and they presented to him gifts, gifts of gold, and Livona, that is uh, frankincense and myrrh. And many people have talked about how these, these gifts point to things, point to his royalty, point, for example, to his priesthood. Now, he's not a Levitical priest, but it points to the fact that he's the high priest of the order of Melchizedek. This Livona, this frankincense was used in the temple service. It has to do with worship. So it speaks about him as king, the gold, Livona, his priesthood, and then the moor or the myrrh has to do with burying his death. So many significant things are seen when we look at what the scripture reveals concerning these gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Look now to verse 12. And being warned in a dream, so much is happening because of these dreams that God is communicating to them because these individuals are faithful servants and God gives his faithful servants revelation. So being warned in a dream not to return to Herod. Now Herod can have his plans, but realize something. He was never successful. Write this down. I will never be successful in my plans that go against the will of God. And even if you do achieve what you want and not God's will, you will never know any joy from that. It will leave you empty and frustrated and not satisfied. So be wise, listen to God, seek Him, do what He's leading you to do, and you're going to find that that is going to be the greatest source of joy that a person can have. Does that mean you won't have problems? No, you'll have problems. There'll be much opposition, but you will experience, experience that intimacy with God, His presence in your life, and you'll know His, His comfort 
and you will know his provision as you overcome the attacks of the enemy. Look again. It says, And in a dream they did not, having been warned, they did not return to Herod, but through another way they withdrew into their own land. So they went back to where they were. Now, what I want you to understand about this is that we see very clearly God's power in this, God's sovereignty, that God's in control, and what God says will be, will be. And it's only wise for us to just accept that, surrender to it, and do it. When we do that, as I said, we are going to see and experience God's presence in our life and we will know so much, so much of His will. He will teach us more and He will provide more and more for us. Look now to verse 13. And them withdrawing, behold, when they withdraw, it says, behold, an angel of the Lord, that same angel of the Lord, and we see Him functioning so much in this. Why? Well, when we speak about the angel of the Lord, he always is mentioned in the concept or context of salvation, of God working to bring about the fulfillment of His purposes for His people. And that's why it's the angel of the Lord, the angel Lord doing all these things. Because this is all happening for God to bring about the completion of His purposes. Why Messiah came the first time and why He will come the second time. So it's not surprising we can expect that the angel of the Lord be spoken of here. Look again, verse 13. And having withdrawn these individuals, these uh, wise men, behold, the angel of the Lord manifested in a dream to who? Yosef. And we're going to see next week how this angel instructed Yosef in order to save him from the attacks of the enemy, specifically from Herod and what he wanted to do and putting this child, the Savior, the Redeemer, the Son of God, to death. So we are absolutely in need of God's presence and His guidance in our life. And when we submit to His will, we can expect that and we will certainly experience it. I'll close with that. Until next week, Shalom. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.